All right, so I'll go ahead and get us started. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brandon Jordan. I've been a tournament director uh, for the better part of a year, probably going on a year now. I've been playing chess for long enough that I should have known the rules longer than I have, but it wasn't really until I had to do the local TD test that I actually did a sit down and throw a read of the rules. And ever since I've been TDing, I've been noticing players losing games they should draw and drawing games they should win losing games they should draw and so on and it's all buried in the rules and i for the purposes of this lecture i thought it might be useful even if you walk out of here learning one new thing that uh, maybe you won't lose a game you should have won um, to prepare for this lecture i reread the rules and uh, was looking for things that you as a player can do to affect the result of the game. And I kind of combined that with a lot of these war stories I've had from being a TD at all these tournaments and seeing the things that go wrong and the way people lose because they may not be on top of the rules and making sure the rules are being followed. So, and I've kind of broken them down for the purposes of this lecture into four broad categories. There's clock nonsense, which I've seen plenty of. There are illegal moves touch move shenanigans, and then kind of a catch-all category of other stuff that's going on. So off the top, I want to say that the rules, the USCF rules are written in a way that's very favorable to tournament directors. Okay, so like tournament directors can basically mess up everything and almost do nothing and the rules aren't going to punish them for it. So you can imagine if you're at a TD and you've got a tournament with like 50 tables, there's no way that you can run around and catch every little thing that might be going off and going wrong in the rules. So it's up to you as a player to know the rules and see that they are enforced. Because as a, a tournament director, I, I can intervene, but the variation that we practice, because it's impractical to do so, is that tournament directors never intervene in your games. So if somebody is breaking the rules, the only way for you to get them to stop is to pause your clock raise your hand and get someone like myself over to solve the problem. So we'll start with section one, which is clock nonsense. And, and in these, each of these sections, I've got war stories from actual scenarios, some of them video reenactments, some of them actual video that we've taken at Tunnel Vision. Uh, this first one, I'm glad to see Mike Saylor here because it involves him. I am National Master Psych. Mayor. And I am his random opponent at the snowstorm tournament. I think I have at least a draw here, maybe a win, but we are playing on a five second delay and my national master opponent only has seven seconds left on his clock. So I've been blitzing out moves hoping that he'll flag and I'm gonna keep blitzing him out. Oh no! a blunder. Why was I moving so quickly? I'm trying to flag him. I guess that's okay. I'm losing my rook, but that's okay, right? Because I'm going to flag him. He only has seconds, seven seconds left, right? Yes, it's no problem at all. No problem at all. Wait a second. Now you have 24 seconds. We're supposed to be on delay. What is this? I wouldn't have been playing so fast if I knew it was a delay. Oh, no. What? What? So that's a faithful dramatic reenactment of what happened. So, <laughs> so Snowstorm was a bring your own clock tournament, right? And so everybody was there with their own clock set for a game 45 delay five. And it's supposed to be a delay, which means that after every move you have five seconds to make your move, but it's not adding to your clock like an increment would, right? And so the, the clock that was at the table was set for an increment. Now, the thing is you're not stuck with defective clocks. If you notice that your clock is not set right, this is one of those moments where you should immediately pause the clock and get your hands up. So in order to do that, first of all, you gotta know what time, co time control you're playing under, so be ready to do that. Uh, second of all, you'll notice that the rules say that you have to do this as soon as you're aware of it. The problem with Mr. Psych Mailer's opponent in the snowstorm tournament was that he waited till the very end of the game and maybe he didn't notice it I don't know but he's been playing the whole game with time being added to his clock and only when he's trying to flag his opponent is he worried about the clock which is now adding to the time so and, and actually if he had paused it even when it was at seven seconds and say hey let's get this, this clock replaced 
we could have done that. Now, the only thing with that is that there's a bit of a nuance. We don't have that problem here at the Columbia Chess Club because we provide our own equipment. We give you the clocks that you're supposed to be using. But when you bring in your own clocks, sometimes you're not going to have clocks that run a delay, even though the time control is supposed to be an increment. So this might have been one of those examples where the clock only did increment, which is an acceptable substitute at the start of a game for a delay clock. So that actually, there was nothing wrong with the clock except for right when it got to the end. But again, if the clock's not set for the time control you want, get your hand up. Next one is a video from a, is this a blitz? I think it's a 10-0 blitz at our chess club. And this is between Bob and Jay. And you'll notice uh, Jay's clock here. He's ticking down. They're in an end game. Black's clearly winning here. And then... J flags, but Bob doesn't notice because he's thinking about this, this game and continuing to play. And now they're both flagged. And then just, and then just says, wait a second, you ran out of time. And Bob says, your flag's down too. <laughs> so what, what happened here? Um, when is the clock, when is the flag down? When do you actually flag? And the rule says you flag when either player points it out. So your clock, when it hits zero, you're not flagged yet. It's only when you or your opponent points it out. Now, why you would be pointing out your own flag being down, I don't know. So there's an unwritten pro tip. Don't flag yourself. <laughs> Uh, but the reality is if you are playing a blitz game and your flag goes down, you should keep playing, even if you know your time is out. And it's, uh, it's not unsportsmanlike to do that. I think it takes a certain level of skill to be able to split your attention between the game and the clock to notice when your opponent's time is down. If you're just so focused in on what's happening on the board and you don't see the flag fall, that's on you. So keep playing. Um, the other thing is, and this is sneaky. The rules have got this buried in here. If you finish your game, you better pause your clock. Whether it's checkmate or because your opponent flagged or otherwise, just always do it as a matter of habit. Because right here buried in the rules, it says, if a player whose flag is still up claims a win on time but does not stop the clock in time to prevent the flag from falling, the game is drawn unless the flag fall was observed by a director or independent witness. So if you're sitting there playing a game with your opponent, you've got you know, 10 seconds left on your clock, and you're like, oh, you flagged. And you think the game is over, your clock ticks off to zero, and now both of your flags are down. Unless somebody else saw that, it's a draw. Even though it was very clear that your time ran out and you claimed it, the rules say otherwise. So always pause that clock to be able to demonstrate that you still had time left on your clock before your opponent's flag ran down. So this next scenario, dramatic reenactment, actually occurred in a Scholastics tournament. Hi, my name is Brandon. Hi, my name is Alvin. And we're playing a rated game of chess. Okay, so this is one where I've hit the clock without making a move. And I guess it's something that could happen when you're just kind of caught up in the moment and you're energetically hitting the clock back and forth. And all of a sudden you find yourself hitting your clock before you've actually made a move. And I think there's two ways to look at this. Uh, the rules state that you're only allowed to hit the clock after moving. So the two ways you could look at this situation is you've incorrectly hit the clock which I would probably award a standard penalty of a two, two minutes added to your clock if your opponent did this. Or it would be an illegal move, which if you look at it that way, could be a loss if you're in a blitz game. So don't allow your opponent to press the clock. And I would recommend don't just, uh, if your opponent hits the clock without moving, I probably would not just hit my clock to say, hey, no, it's your turn. Pause the clock, get your hand up because you, sh you're, you should be awarded a penalty in that situation, two minutes or, or if you're in a blitz game, potentially a win. 
But this is going to come up again. I'm Brandon. And we're playing at the uh, Blitz game with not a lot of time left. No play. No play. Notice the hands. No, you're not. Not allowed to do that. The rules say that when you are playing chess, you have to operate the clock with the same hand you use to move the pieces. This has a big impact if you're playing a blitz game, your opponent's doing this number, right? Sometimes they'll, like, it's so instantaneous, they're moving the piece but hitting the clock before the piece is even, like, released. And so they're able to play moves faster if they can use both hands. Don't let anybody do that. Um, there's also this other mention about you're not allowed to hover hand. You know, not allowed to keep your hand hovering over the clock. I don't see how you can do that if you're following the rule about using the same hand to move as you do to hit the clock. But either way, if your opponent's doing this, get your hand up. First infraction is probably going to be a warning by the tournament director, but if it continues to happen, which is very possible because these are blitz moments, right? People are doing things on instinct and making mistakes on instinct. We, it can be more serious from there forward, right? Like a two minute, et cetera, which can have a, or in a blitz game, a one minute standard penalty, which can have a big impact on the outcome of the game. Don't let your opponent play with two hands. So that brings us to our section two on illegal moves. And I'll start the discussion of this section with uh, this position, which is black to play and win. And I'll give you all a second to think about it. Interesting position. So white has just played bishop to d4. Anybody have any thoughts on how black plays and wins here? Anybody other than Charlie? She's got special information. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Anybody else? Yes? Roman? Rook takes e2. Now, this is a bit of a trick question because I didn't tell you the time control of this game. If you're in a blitz game, Roman's got the right answer. Rook takes king. Black wins. If you're in a standard time control game, you pause the clock and you get your additional two minutes and you back up to the last non-illegal position. But the actual rules on it are here. And it says if you, oh, and I will, I do want to mention that this actually occurred, not this exact position, but a position very similar to this actually occurred in a blitz game at our Thursday night event. The actual game continuation was king f8 followed by king d3. Both players walked back out of check. <laughs> okay. The blitz rules say that, yes, you take the king if the king is in check, or you can just pause the clock and claim a win. It's the same thing. The uh, other thing is that you have to, uh, I have seen a variation of this in a blitz game. And when I say blitz, just so you all know, blitz is when you have 10 or fewer minutes on the clock. The way the USCF rules calculate this is you'll take the number of minutes plus the number of increment and delay or whatever. So like a three, a three minute with a two second delay would be three plus two equals five. So that would be a blitz game. Right, this uh, I have seen in a blitz game on a Thursday night event a player who made an illegal move, but didn't hit their clock, and then resigned because they thought they had lost. In blitz, you can make all the illegal moves you want as long as you don't consummate it by hitting the clock. The rules in blitz are really, really bad against people who mess with the clock. But if you don't touch the clock, you can make illegal moves. So don't. Uh, if you make an illegal move, you have touched the piece, which has implications, as we'll talk about in a minute, but you can still play on as long as you don't hit your clock. I'm Charlie. I'm Ellie. We're playing a rated game of chess. <laughs> 
So what, what do you do when your opponent is knocking over pieces? The rules say that you have to replace those pieces on your own time. So you're not allowed to hit your clock, and that's exactly what it says. You're not allowed to hit your clock until you have reestablished the position. So if you knock over a piece, you got to fix it, then hit the clock. But if you hit the clock and you haven't corrected the piece, that can potentially be an illegal move if you have replaced the piece on the wrong square. Because you'd effectively be moving mul multiple pieces at the same time. Now there are a few uh, recommendations that the USCF has in its rules that I disagree with and I would, I would argue that you don't use. And that's in the red here. It says that if your opponent has knocked over a piece and hasn't fixed it, that you can just hit your clock to put them back on move so they'll have time to fix their pieces and then they can hit the clock. I would recommend against doing that because it probably is going to confuse your opponent as to why you're doing that. And it's not going to help you any, especially if there's an increment and you're just adding time to the clocks. You're better off saying, hey, you're not allowed to do that. Get your hand up. TD comes over. First inf infraction, probably a warning, but it guards you against multiple infractions, which would cause you to gain time with a time penalty. So pause your clock. Get your hands up if your opponent's knocking pieces over and not fixing them on their clock. The other instance of touch move that's a little unusual is this special case where you have a pawn that you are promoting to the last rank. The rules say that when your piece reaches the last rank, you have to replace it with a replacement piece, usually a queen, before you hit your clock because it is illegal to move a pawn to the last rank, right? The USCF rules do not care whether you put the replacement piece there first and just remove the pawn or whether you move the pawn to the last rank and then put the piece in place of it. That doesn't matter. What matters is you do something like that before the clock is hit. I have seen this happen at an early tunnel vision where opponent uh, played, it was a time pressure situation, game 45 to lay five. Pawn was pushed to the last rank, clock was hit. And the other player, who's like, hey, you got to replace that, followed this advice in the red, which is the same advice about just hit your clock and make it there move again. And because it was a time pressure situation, the other player is like, I don't understand. You can't hit my, you know, you didn't make a move. And they hit the clock back, and they start fighting over the clock, okay? Don't follow this advice in red. My recommendation is to, if your opponent pushes a pawn to the last rank, pause the clock, get your hands up. I'm going to treat it like an illegal move. And actually, I think there's some debate in the USCF TD community as to whether or not this is technically an illegal move. The blitz rules say that pushing a pawn to the last rank without promoting is improper. <laughs> the, the definition of promotion says that you have to replace it with a piece before you hit your clock. So in my, in my book, this is an illegal move. So if you're in that situation where you're in time pressure and you do pause your clock and raise your hand and I walk over or somebody at this club walks over, we're going to award you a standard time penalty of two minutes, which in a time pressure situation where these things are likely to occur, that can have a big impact on the game. So pro tip, hitting clock before promoting is illegal, which brings us to section three, which is touch move shenanigans. So. The touch move rule is really short and sweet, but from it flow a lot of different rules. This is it, and I've highlighted the different portions of this rule in different colors to kind of break it down. So when you're, uh, the touch move rule first, if you accidentally touch something, that's always okay. All right, I've actually seen people lose games because they just totally accidentally touch something. Their opponent called them on a touch move they didn't know the rules, so they're like, oh well. And then they had to move the piece they accidentally touched. Don't lose a game because of that. The next thing is that adjustments are okay. So if you're adjusting a piece, normally people say, I adjust, and they move a piece to adjust it into the center of a square. That's not the only thing that you can do to adjust a piece. In fact, the USCF rules say anything that you do that suggests that you're just adjusting it rather than moving it is fine. So if I, have a, if I have a chess piece on a square and, I'm, and I do this number to center it up, 
nobody's going to interpret that as an intentional attempt to move the piece. That looked like an adjustment, so it is under the rules. But you're better off saying I adjust or je do. The other part of this rule in the red is that the touch move rule applies not to anything, any of your pieces that can move or any of your opponent's pieces that you can capture. So it's possible that you touch your opponent's piece and then you have to capture it if you can. It could even be that you touch your piece that, and then your opponent's piece, but your piece isn't allowed to move, but you touched your opponent's piece, and so now you have to capture it with another piece. So it doesn't matter what you're touching. If you touch anything on the board, you're going to have to move it or you're going to have to capture it if you're able to. The next thing is that uh, this comes up in scholastic situations a lot. You'll have people that think with their hands and not with their eyes. I always say think with your eyes and not with your hands. But you'll have it where the kid will be like, I want to move this piece, I want to move this piece, I want to move this piece. And the next thing you know, you've touched five different things, and then you move one. The rule actually specifies the first thing you touch is the thing you have to move or capture. Right? Yes, sir? Being that uh, it is never possible in a legal board space to capture a king, uh, any touching of a king would always, an enemy king would always be an adjustment, even if one were to say, lift it off the board and break the top off of it. That's going to come up. Yes, sir. Well, just because if you're just like on a king then, what if your king has the square to move to? Do you actually move the king? Say again. What if the king actually has squares that can move? Yeah, if, you have, if the king has available squares, legal moves, okay. and it's your king, you got to move it. All right, my last question is, uh -huh. what if your piece has pins and you touch it? And if you actually touch it? Depends on the type of pin. I think you're referring to an absolute pin, which means it's pinned to a king, right. in which case it's excused, which is in the purple says that can be moved or captured. In that instance, it would be against the rules to move it. So you can touch it all you want. You don't have to move it. <laughs> yes, Alvin. <laughs> OK, good. You'll, you will one day. <laughs> yes, sir. You're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So when do you claim a touch move? Uh, get a TD after your opponent finishes their move, only if the touch move is worse than the actual move. So this is actually, okay, yeah, okay. Your opponent can touch a piece, then touch another piece and move that piece. And you think, hmm, I probably should not claim the touch move rule here because if they'd have moved that other thing, I would have been busted. Uh, but luckily, they moved on. Uh, so, you know, pick your spots. You don't have to claim every touch move just because it's touch move, right? Allow your opponent to break the rules when it makes them worse. Um, uh, the other pro tip I already mentioned, which is that you should say, I adjust. Even if, even if it's allowed that you can nudge pieces, always say, je doob. Say, je doob and not, I adjust, because it is more pretentious and therefore more appropriate in a game of chess. The other thing is that the touch move rule also plays into whether or not you should say the word check when you're playing a game of chess to let your opponent know they're in check. Never do it. It's always depicted in the media whenever anybody, any actor or actress is playing a game of chess that they'll put somebody in check and they'll say check primarily for the benefit of the audience. And so now everybody thinks when we play games of chess, there's a bunch of people saying check back and forth. Don't do it. Because if your opponent doesn't see that they're in check and they touch a piece, not realizing they're in check, they're now obligated to stop that check with that piece if they can. So they might touch their queen, going to take your queen, but now they've got to move it in the way of a check. And you take it with a bishop or something like that. So don't say check because of the touch move rule. So, uh, yeah, but do say just do. Right, Charlie. Next, next scenario. Hi, I'm Austin Sun Schaefer. And I'm his random opponent at a tunnel vision tournament. I've reached this position and I'm about to castle. What? So some of y'all may have noticed the way that I castled there. So I reached out, I grabbed my rook, I moved it to the uh, the f8 square, and then I put my king on the other side to 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 complete the castling position. This is illegal, and this actually happened in a game. The game is playing over here on the right at Tunnel Vision. Austin was in the last round on the top board of his section. 
and his opponent touched the rook and castled. And that's why this next move looks funny. Because the rules say if you touch the rook first when you're castling, that's not castling. That's moving the rook, and you have to move the rook. Yeah. Yeah, so then he blundered three pawns and lost. But, you know, it's difficult to deal with that uh, when you don't have any king safety. So this could, this could really bite you if you don't know this rule and you end up on board one of a, uh, of a serious tournament and touch your rook before your king. Castling is a king move. Always use one hand to castle and start with the king because it's a king move. The next uh, little nuance of the touch move rule to round things out on touch moves is that it only applies when it's your turn. So it says player on move is not allowed to touch stuff, right? Okay. It's Hans's move. Yes, let's right? see what happens, yes. And then... What? Oh! King. Oh! oh no! I... <laughs> he was supposed to pick up a he piece of all the And he broke... Oh, and he broke the... <laughs> what? I what? cannot believe what just happened. Oh my god. He and just broke the king for some happening? reason and he put it back. And now he's telling him, let's go outside and, and fight. <laughs> what, what, what is this? Okay, I so this is from the, the 2022 U.S. No, Championship. Funny, but maybe yeah, Hans the, kicked him uh, under the table? Is, is, is that what happened? And we have Hans <laughs> Neiman is black, okay. and it's his turn to move, <laughs> and his opponent, Sam Savian, reaches time. out. <laughs> and just grabs his king right in the middle of the game and starts playing with it, breaks the top off, flings it back onto the board in a random location. Okay, this is totally legal. <laughs> okay, I don't recommend it because there are other rules uh, against annoying your opponent. This would probably fall into that category, right? Uh, so Hans did the right thing here. He paused the clock and got a, a tournament director probably to tell him, hey, my opponent's lost his mind. Can we stop messing with my king? Which is good. Okay. But this doesn't have any touch move implications because it wasn't Sam's turn. Now, uh, if you have a fidgety opponent who just likes to fiddle with stuff that's on the board, the moment you hit that clock, they're on move, even if they're right in the middle of touching something. So, Charlie, watch out for that one. <laughs> All right, that gets us to the last section of this catch-all other stuff, too. Um, lots of little things in here, uh, just so that y'all know about them. Uh, I'm going to start this discussion of this section with this situation. So, this is black to move. This happened in an actual tournament. It was a Game 25 tournament. And white has offered a draw in this position. And black still has half their clock left, 12 minutes left. So the draw is out there. What do you do? And I'll give you a moment to mull this position. And then I'll take a poll by hands to see what people would do. If you think you know what you would do, let me know with a hand. Would you take this draw or do something else? What would you do? Time for hands. If you, if you think you know, I'll take a poll when I see that people are, have done, have, have finished contemplating I'm this position. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the first hand. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I, I would not take that draw. Okay, Eli says no. How many people would, would would not take the draw. Well, that's part of it. Okay, how many people would take the draw? How many people would do something else? Yeah, so it's my turn. Do something else. What, what else would you do? I mean, there's this other thing that's available. It's like, I just don't see why I have to take draw. Okay, all right. Uh, so I really want to know why they're asking for a draw on my turn. <laughs> well, they, they asked for a draw and then hit their clock. So the draw oh, is... They, they offered the draw and then hit my... Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the draw has been properly offered. Okay. Yes? So I have a question. How much time does Blake have? Blake plays on like a minute. They both have about the, uh, the same amount of time. But the, the time pressure situation, you're not going to flag them. It's, it's a legit draw. Yes. Sure. So if you offer a draw, you, that's your move, and then it doesn't deny its move? Like that's on the clock? We'll get to it. Yes, okay. Eli? Just move. Not say yes or no. Sure. Okay. Um, 
so this is an interesting situation. So this is one of my students at a tournament, and they looked at the position. They might have taken 30 seconds, and they quickly accepted the draw. Now, okay, I might say, hey, uh, play on because what you know? Why are you accepting draws when you could be getting experience? But <clears throat> the biggest problem I had with with him taking the draw was that he still had 12 minutes on his clock. Okay, the rules say that. Once you offer a draw, you cannot withdraw it. So if your opponent has offered you a draw and you have 12 minutes left in a sharp position like this, you've got 12 minutes to think before accepting that draw. Okay. Now as it happens, this position is probably 0.5 in favor of black. Uh, and the reason it is is because there's some sharp lines that continue uh, with rook f to c8 because of back rank mate problems. Now white has ways of counter countering that, but they probably have to give back a little bit of material. And okay, black has the initiative, but it was close enough that he could accept the draw. But with this sharp a position, a draw offer is a gift. It's like, hey, I'm about to not lose this game, so let me think for 12 minutes if I need to to figure out whether I'm going to accept a draw. I would think that somewhere in that 12 minute process, my my student would have said, hey. I'm going to play rook c8 because this is really tricky and actually very hard for white to play. Uh, the other thing is that there's a time to offer a draw. And the time is if you want to offer a draw to your opponent, you should make a move, offer a draw, then hit your clock in that order. The reason is that if you offer a draw, you can't take it back. And if you haven't made your move yet and your clock is running, you're either about to flag or you're about to make a move without being able to withdraw your draw offer, right? So if your opponent offers you a draw and they haven't moved, your response should be, make your move. And then see what they do. If it's a blunder, you turn that draw down. <laughs> and if it's not, then you make your, uh, make your decision as you need to. So let's move on to the next subject, which is notation. Everyone is required to notate if it affects your classical rating. So if it's dual rated or if it's classical rated and your classical rating is on the line in any way, you have to be notating. Don't lose by not notating. Okay? The rules say you can lose by notating. And in fact, both players can, can lose by refusing to notate. I've never seen that happen. But it is mandatory. But there are other reasons why you should, other, other than it just being illegal not to do that. The first reason and biggest reason is you need it to claim draws. So we all know about the three move, the threefold repetition, 50 move rule. In the case of the threefold repetition rule, the rules state that in order to claim that, you have to have what's called a reasonably complete score sheet, which means that a score sheet that has uh, no more than three incorrect move pairs. So you're notating the entire game and a move pair is black, a white move and a black move. If you've got more than three of those messed up or not notated, you can't claim a threefold repetition at all. Big problem. Okay. The other thing is 50 move rule. You have to be able to, as it's highlighted, demonstrate that you've hit your 50 moves. And the only way to do that is be, to be showing a TD. You've got a score sheet that's got 50 moves on it without a pawn move or a capture. So if you're not notating it, you're losing you know, your 50, 50 move rules turning into the 51 move rule, 52 move rule, 53 move rule for every, every move you're not notating. So always be notating so you can claim the draws. Um, I've also had uh, at least one game where person A and person B disagreed about where a piece was located on the board. So person A said, oh, this bishop's on this square. Person B said, no, it's on this square, right? But only one of them had a score sheet. So guess who won the argument? The guy with the score sheet. Yeah, score sheet is going to defend you against uh, hopefully legitimate but potentially dangerous mistakes that your opponent's making. It's going to give you draws that you otherwise can't claim. So always do it. Uh, in our club, if your opponent is not notating, what I will do is I will come, and any of the TDs at the Columbia Chess Club will come and make them copy up. So if you've got a complete score sheet, they're not notating, my instruction to them is going to be you have to get your opponent's score sheet, 
and copy up every move to become current before you play your next move. So think about that. You might, uh, you might can game that a little bit. Uh, if your opponent has eight minutes left on their clock, that might be an optimum time to make them copy up because uh, once they get under five minutes, they don't have to notate at all, and I'm not going to force them to do that. Uh, but you can, uh, the other point of this is if you've made a mistake on your score sheet and you're worried about not being able to claim draws or not being able to uh, adjudicate disputes, uh, you are allowed to force your opponent to give you their score sheet so you can copy up. So uh, ordinarily this is just done between the players, hey, can I copy your score sheet? So while your clock is running, you say, you know, ask for a copy, you copy up. If they say no, you can force them to give it to you because the rules say the score sheets are owned by the tournament directors, the organizers. So we can come over and they're like, you know, you have to give it to them. Okay? So if you're not notating, fix it. Um, this is actual video from Tunnel Vision 5. Uh, this is in February 2023, and it needs a little bit of backstory. So this, um, this involves uh, the discussion that we had earlier about when the proper time to claim a draw is and how to accept it. Uh, and it involves some issues about notation. We have uh, Will Snyder over here in the red shirt, and on the other side of the table from him is James Thompson. This is the last round. James is on four seconds with a five-second delay left. And if you look at this position, uh, and you can imagine being James in this position, you might be a little annoyed that your opponent is continuing to play. Uh, Will, by contrast, has about 20 minutes on his clock. But he's blitzing him out, right? He's trying to flag James because the winner of this game wins the tournament. So I'm sure James is annoyed by this. And so at some point in this game, once the position gets stale like this, James says, this is a draw, kind of emotes a little bit, shows his annoyance and says, hey, you know, I offer you a standing draw. Anytime you want to take this draw, you take it. And they continue to play. And this is how it continues. So right about here is where Black realizes, hey, I better take that standing draw. Everybody see why? <laughs> and so that's exactly what Will does. He says, hey, how about that draw? Uh, let me oh, click the wrong slide. Hang on. How about that draw? And James says, no. And they continue to play. And then white wins easily. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's an interesting situation. Um, the moral of the story is that there's no such thing as a standing draw because every draw offer is declined by the next move. So anybody that if you touch a piece and make a move, the draw is declined. They don't carry over from one move to the next. Uh, so. James was totally correct to say, no, you don't get the standing draw offer, although I'm assuming you didn't know the rules well enough to not offer it in the first place, which you probably shouldn't have because it would have been misleading. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, James is in a tough spot here. He was getting flagged by somebody with 20 extra minutes in a completely drawn position. He ended up winning, but he got lucky. He was, uh, I was standing nearby, he says, hey, are y'all looking for... Uh, three-fold repetition or 50-move rule, right? Now, remember before I said in order to claim those, you had to have a reasonably complete score sheet, but this is an exception because if you're under five minutes, you don't have to notate. And the rules say that you can be awarded a draw by triple occurrence or by 50-move rule by ob observation of a director. So my pro tip on this is if you're ever in the same situation where your opponent's trying to dirty flag you, Pause the clock, raise your hand, and ask a TD to come over and witness for the occurrence of a threefold or a 50 move, uh, 50 move rule. That way, if it happens, you get the benefit of that. The only thing is, it doesn't excuse you from actually claiming it. So if you think you've hit the 50 move or a threefold repetition, you have to pause the clock and turn to your tournament director who's witnessing and say, I claim whatever, right? Threefold or 50 move. Yes, sir. Uh, 
That's right. You can't say that's right. And actually, that is the best way to decline a draw. So if somebody offers you a draw, you might say something like, eh, that gets misinterpreted, right? If you continue to play chess, there's no confusion about whether you accept the draw or not. That's a, a clear de decline of a draw. Then that's how I recommend you draw, uh, decline your draw. Absolutely. Yeah. You can stop the clock. In fact, stopping the clock is always acceptable for any uh, any uh, any assistance you need from a TV, even if it's to clarify the rules. So in that situation, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's true. I th it's it's a little bit easier uh, with our tunnel vision tournaments because we have our DGT boards and we can use our software to detect the existence of a 50 move roll, a threefold repetition. So I actually don't need to be at your table if you're on one of these electronic boards because the software is going to send me a notification that it occurred. Uh, but if you think about it, if you're in a dirty flag situation, you're probably one of the last boards. And so the tournament's thinned out by then. Uh, and we already, as a team, try to put eyeballs on every game that has a time pressure situation just for weird things that happen at the end like this. So hopefully we're already there. Yes? Why is it asking for a TV becoming excessive? Like you're pausing the clock just to... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the rules basically have a, have a catch-all for any sort of annoying behavior or disingenuous behavior. Uh, you're always supposed to be sportsmanlike and respectful of your opponent. So if you're doing anything repetitively, like I think the Sam Sevian grabbing Hans Niemann's king in the middle of his, I mean, that to me is annoying, and he ought to be chastised for that, right? But, uh, but yeah, anything you do, if you cough too much, right, or if you're playing with something that makes noise or smacking weird or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> you can complain about anything. Uh, it reflects on both players, though, so take care on what you complain about. Um, adding to what Mike said, I think actually this rule uh, helps the TVs because you, it, put, it puts an obligation on you to alert the TVs that your board is one of the ones out of the entire hall that needs attention. You know, so like if they aren't if they aren't dutifully tracking like who's low on time. Yeah, and I don't know when that particular rule was introduced, but it's definitely there now. Uh, and this is just to, to round out the, the draw issue, you know, the rule about not, there not being anything such as a standing draw. You can reject or accept either orally or by deliberately touching a piece. That, that means touching a piece, not moving one. That declines a draw. Okay? And then um, the last, very last thing is you can't claim anything, a draw, win, flag, otherwise, it's not your turn. So if you're trying to get that 50 move rule, a threefold repetition when somebody's dirty flagging, you make sure you're pausing the clock when your paddle's up so that you're still able to make those claims. Yes, sir? So when you say, when you get asked for a draw, you move your piece, say draw, then do the clock. Is that the correct That's sequence? the correct sequence. So if you hit that clock and then ask for a draw, that's not even... No. Hard. So you can, you can still offer a draw during your opponent's move, but it's considered annoying behavior. Okay. <laughs> the rules actually call this out. Uh, also, repetitively offering draws is, is, uh, is a problem, too. Yeah, okay. but uh, the proper time to offer a draw is after you've made your move, but before you've hit your clock. Thank you. Yes, sir? Just completely related to that. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, my opponent will offer me a draw if they say, I think that's. No, that draw uh, that draw offer does not disappear until you touch a piece. That draw. I was wondering how that works. You know, I use it every Yep. The draws cannot be withdrawn by the player who offers them. Only by the opponent who touches a piece or says, "I decline." Claim the draw. Yep, exactly right. Exactly right. And that's it. Are there any other any other questions? Thank you. Hopefully, y'all get some of the hidden elo in these rules. Yes, sir.
Yeah. I, I don't know if I'm, I, I'm never happened to me, but just curious. Like, if, if they offer you a draw, you accept it, uh, and then for whatever reason, maybe they see something, suddenly they're like, I didn't offer you a draw, or they think that they got the rules different, and now they don't want the draw. Like, what? So you, you agree on the result, and you stop playing your game, and you change your mind? Well, I think what he's saying is opponent offers a draw, and then just denies it ever happened. Yeah. Oh. Um, like, I don't have a good answer for you on that. I mean, ultimately, chess is a game that's supposed to be played between two people, and y'all are the people that are watching the rules violations and stuff like that. I haven't seen, uh, in, uh, ex with one exception, I think that all the players that have played in any of the tournaments I've watched have made a good faith attempt to abide by the rules. Um, and I think as a tournament director, we would come by, if there's a dispute like this, we would try to investigate it by, you know, asking both players their side of the stories, checking to see if there were any witnesses and that sort of thing, uh, and then making the best decision we can based on evidence we, that we have, which might even be the demeanor of the players as they ch try to explain what happened, right? Um, but hopefully you just never run into that, that situation. Yeah. yeah it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And impartiality of a witness matters. Yeah, I mean, th things are getting a little better on that front because we have more technology now. You know, more things are on camera than used to be, even at this club. And we're not really that, you know, we're not like a national tournament level tech setup or anything. But uh, we do have some technology out there. Uh, I don't know. I guess you could just say nudge your play. Hey, you heard that draw, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you really wanted to, get, let's say you're, you're playing somebody that's, uh, this is the lawyer of me thinking now, okay, you're playing somebody that you don't trust uh, as far as you can throw them and they're offering you a draw that you don't think they're going to stick to because you're looking at the board and you're not seeing the same thing they are, <laughs> you might say, hey, write that on my score sheet and I'll consider it. <laughs> but I don't have much for you. Anything else? On to classical.